Lord, we just would ask once more that your spirit would come and guide us through the word. You have so much love and grace for us, and yet we as human beings struggle to see it, struggle to grasp it, struggle to incorporate it truly in our lives. Today we ask that you will help us to understand more deeply. What you do for us is help us to see the guilt, the sin that is real in our lives, but heal it, Lord, heal it as only you could to make us whole and guilt-free and full of living in your grace. So we ask for that and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So John 8, chapter, uh, chapter 8, verse 2. So at dawn, he appeared again. This is talking about Jesus. He appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And he sat down to teach them. And the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. And they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus. Now you recognize this. They're always trying to find a way to catch Jesus, to trap him in some way. They said to Jesus, teacher... This woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? And they were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. Sounds familiar, right? They always seem to be putting Jesus on the spot. I want you to notice that Jesus doesn't usually answer these questions directly because he gets asked over and over again these kinds of trap questions. And if you've noticed, Jesus hardly ever gives a clear, direct answer. He usually asks a question in return. This time, he doesn't answer directly. He actually, for a little bit, says nothing. And so we read there, what it says there is that Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. And they kept on questioning. He, He straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and he he wrote in the ground. And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first. Now, I don't know what you think about that, but the older ones first. Maybe they've lived longer. Maybe they were guilty of more. I don't know, but they saw it. Apparently, they recognized what he was doing. And they walked away. The old ones first, until Jesus was the only one left with the woman still standing there. And Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So Jesus doesn't decide to give an answer about her. What we understand is that when he knelt down and started writing in the sand, what was he writing? He was, he was writing their sins. Now, I don't think he put names on them. Somebody sent me a message between services and they reminded me of this. He probably didn't attach the names. So no one knew any other sins that he was calling out, but they knew. And as they saw Jesus writing, they knew that he knew. So rather than condemning her, He reminded them that they were also guilty. And when they realized what he was doing, none of them wanted to face that. None of them wanted to acknowledge the reality that they also were guilty. So they couldn't throw the stone. They couldn't accuse her anymore. And they walked away. Now we learned two, two lessons from this story in some way, I think. First lesson we learned is that all are guilty of sin. Because nobody was left. They were all sinners. And they knew it. We may think ourselves sometimes exempt of guilt until Jesus begins to write our sins in the sand. Hopefully none of us has the opportunity for that to happen. We don't really want that. Hopefully it happens when we're privately with him and he needs to tell us the things that are in our life and we see them as they are. But no one is free of guilt. Not any one of us. The second thing we learn here, I think is very important, is that Jesus didn't come to this world to catch us and condemn us. He didn't come here to try to sneak up on us and and find a way to trick us so he could tell us how wrong we are and how bad we are. Jesus came into this world to seek us and to find us and forgive us. To seek and to save the lost. So Jesus isn't looking for the sinner so he can blame them. He's looking for the sinner so he can find them and forgive them. 
So today the question is, are you guilty and are you needing to be found? Are you the one today who needs the healing and the grace that Jesus is so ready to provide? So, John chapter 9 is a chapter where we see this kind of story unfolding, and I want to spend the time to go through the entire chapter of chapter 9. It's one story. And it begins there in verse 1 that Jesus was going along, and he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he has been born blind. So this is an interesting question. The disciples see the man who's blind, and so they think of what people generally thought in that day. They thought, well, if he was born blind, he must be guilty, or somebody must be guilty, because this infirmity, this problem, trouble that has come into his life has to have been earned somehow, they think. And the, the proof of his sin is the punishment that God has delivered upon him. So they thought, well, here's a man who suffered, must be God's judgment upon him, so who sinned, him or his parents? They thought they were asking a good question. Do we ever do that? We'd like to think that we don't. We'd like to think that we've gone beyond that because we realize there's things as medicine and we're more scientific about it and we realize that people who are born blind is not a judgment of God. It's, you know, things happen and Sometimes we just realize that there's natural things in the world that happen to people. But I learned very young, early on as a believer, when I was a teenager, had just really come into the church that sometimes we still do think this way. I had gone to a family's house for lunch after church and Sabbath, and they were talking about some other church members. Now they, I will say, were being loving and kind because they weren't like gossiping. They just were concerned for a person because this person they were speaking of had just discovered they had cancer. And so this Christian family was talking about the person and, and they couldn't help but immediately begin to ask themselves and each other, what did he do? So they began to talk about maybe some things in that person's lifestyle, things they'd seen that person eating, things that the person had been doing. It's so very natural of us to think that there, because we do know there are sometimes consequences, it's not like it's not a thing. But we often think that, well, if it happened, not only did they deserve it, but maybe God's even in it. Maybe God's somehow trying to teach them a lesson. And so we have a tendency to go to the same place these disciples went. So who was being punished? Who is, who is guilty here, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Because certainly that's a tragedy. And Jesus decides to answer in verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now there's a different answer. There's a different understanding of why these things could happen. Jesus says that this man was born blind, not because of his fault or his parents' fault or anybody else's fault. This man was born blind for simply one reason, that God could bless him and that the work of God could be displayed through him. So that a miracle could happen and a witness to the power of God would be exhibited for many people to see. Not only for many, but for this man himself, his life would be changed. If he had not been born blind, the miracle would never have happened. And as we read in the story, as we go on, people would not have realized who Jesus was. So we think bad things happen to us because we were bad. Sometimes bad things happen to us because God is good and he wants to reveal it when he heals us and makes us whole. So next time you're dealing with a challenge, sometime think about maybe God has a plan. Maybe I don't understand it and maybe it's not even for me. But God is good and he will glorify his name. So this is how Jesus heals. Seeing this happen, this is how Jesus heals. Verse 6. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, 
This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now about the Pool of Siloam. Pool of Siloam was a small um, place where the water ran into. The reason it was called sent is because it came through a conduit that had been made and the water was being sent into the Pool of Siloam. So it was sent water that came from another location into that pool. It wasn't very large. I've been to the Pool of Siloam. It's still there. It's um, about the size of a swimming pool, not very deep either. Um, about 20 feet by 30 feet. And so Jesus put mud in this guy's eyes. He, he used saliva, put mud in his eyes. And we think that sounds pretty gross and creepy. But in those days, actually saliva was thought to have healing properties. And so it wasn't terribly unusual for someone to spit and put it on a wound. We would think the opposite because of our knowledge of infection. But it was common to think that way. And so Jesus made some mud with his saliva and he put it on his eyes and he simply says, go wash. The man goes to the pool and he washes it off and he goes home, seeing. Seeing. Miracle happened. Now his neighbors, verse 8, and those who had formerly seen him begging, he'd been that way all his life, People who had formerly seen him begging said, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was. Others said, no, no, he only just looks like him. They weren't even sure. The problem is they hadn't really noticed him that much because he was sitting there begging. They hadn't really talked to him or looked to him. They just walked by him. But now they weren't sure. I think that's him. I think it's the guy. But he himself spoke up. He heard them discussing, I am the man. And they asked, how were your eyes opened? And he replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it in my eyes and he told me to go to Siloam and wash and so I went and washed and then I could see. And where is this man, they asked. I don't know, he said. This is interesting because a couple of things happen here. First of all, I want you to notice that when he's asked about the miracle, When he's asked about it, he says there's a man named Jesus. He calls him a man, but he doesn't know who he is. This man's never seen Jesus. Even after he's healed, he's never seen Jesus before. Because when he was with Jesus, he was blind. Not until after he was healed, right, could he see. But Jesus wasn't with him anymore. He had already gone to the pool. So he had never seen Jesus. He didn't really know who Jesus was. He said, the man healed me. Didn't know anything about him. Didn't know where he went. All he knows is his own story. I was blind, and now I see. So it's interesting and important, I think, that we recognize that that this man's story is his testimony. And his testimony is just his life changed. He did not need a script. He did not need somebody to write a fancy story that would sound amazing because what Jesus did is already amazing. So what is your story? What is it that Jesus has done for you that simply your story is enough? Jesus doesn't need you to make up a story that sounds amazing so that you have something that will surprise people and prove something to them because the proof is already in the story. The proof is in what Jesus has done for you. I was blind, and now I see. What more do you need to know? Well, of course, the Pharisees heard about this man. The neighborhood was talking about it, and how could they not? The neighborhood, you know, they all like, well, this guy, we've been around for a long time. He's been blind, begging. Now he sees? I mean, this doesn't just happen every day. They wanted to know what happened. The strange thing is what they wanted to know. They didn't get amazed by the miracle like you and I would be. They had the same question that the disciples had earlier. Who's guilty? Who is it? We want to know. Who's guilty? But now they weren't asking is it him or his parents. They're looking for something different. They're looking to find out who's guilty of healing him. Who's guilty of the sin of giving this blind man sight? Now, the reason why that's important is found in verse 13. 
They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. And the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. Now we understand. We want to know who's guilty here. We want to know who did this thing on the Sabbath. We're not interested in the healing. We're only interested in that he healed him on Sabbath. Sounds a little crazy? It is crazy. But you understand the context of the situation they were in. The Pharisees had lots of rules about the Sabbath. Now the rules didn't exclude doing any kind of assistance, medical or helping people in all kinds of ways. Rather, it basically said that you could, you could help someone not get worse on the Sabbath, but you couldn't help somebody get better. So the idea was, if you can help them just kind of put off needing more help until after Sabbath, you can do all that restorative thing after Sabbath. But during Sabbath, just do the, the least you can do so they won't die. Don't let them die. But do the least you can, just, just do this thing to get them by so Sabbath can be over. Then you can help them. But clearly Jesus didn't follow that rule because Jesus took a man who was blind and made him see. He actually restored him, which was against the law, against the Sabbath. Because they didn't see the harmony of restoring sight on the Sabbath. They only could see the rules that had been broken. Therefore, in verse 15, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight, the blind man received his sight. Notice his testimony. It doesn't change. He put mud in my eyes, and I washed, and now I see. It's not a complicated testimony. It's pretty hard to argue, except they will. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, speaking of Jesus, but he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said and asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. We don't know whether Jesus is, is good or bad. Is it good for him to heal this man? Because if he was a sinner, he wouldn't have the power to heal. But if he was good, he wouldn't heal on the Sabbath because that's wrong. So they were really disturbed and confused. But they really do want to know who's guilty here. We have to find the person who's guilty here. So they begin to go on a search. They turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. Now why would he say that? Before he described Jesus as a man, now he describes him as a prophet. Because this man knew that just any man didn't perform miracles and have the power to heal. But there was a history, people did know that prophets often perform miracles. And so because this miracle had been performed, the man assumes he must be a prophet. He still had never met Jesus with his eyes. But he could see that there had been a miracle performed, so I don't know who he is, but he must be a prophet. Because something amazing happened. In verse 18, they, they still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. They didn't believe him because what they thought was this was a hoax. They thought that this man wasn't actually blind from birth. It was a made-up story so that Jesus could pretend to heal him. They thought that's what was going on. This was all made up. So what we'll do is we'll go find his parents because probably they won't go along with the hoax, especially if we threaten them. So we'll threaten his parents to tell us the truth. Maybe they will tell us. Because we don't believe this actually happened as a miracle. And so they go and find his parents. Verse 19, is this your son? They were asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? So the parents are a little cautious because these are important people asking this question. And as you'll see, they're going to threaten to excommunicate them, which is kind of bad in a small community. And so they say, we know he is our son. We know this. And we know that he was born blind. We can tell you that. But how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. So ask him. He's of age. Let him speak for himself. Whew, we got out of that one. So the Jewish leaders, who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue, that is why his parents said, he's of age, ask him. They didn't want to get in the middle of it. 
So in verse 24, a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Now this phrase, give glory to God, was a commonly used phrase in those days. A commonly used phrase to mean, um, gl- give glory to God meaning honor God, tell the truth. To give glory to God meant that you would be honest. To give glory to God meant you wouldn't lie. So give glory to God and tell us the truth. Don't play this game anymore, they said to him. Tell us the truth, honor God, swear it. Because we already know that Jesus is a sinner. So you're not covering anything anymore. We already know this. So just go ahead and tell us the truth. And the man replied once more, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. I don't know anything about him. Here's what I know. I was born blind, and now I see. You can argue. You can think it's not true. But I was born blind, and clearly I now can see. And then they ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Uh, I think he knew better, but he was kind of now toying with them because they weren't listening. They didn't want to hear the truth. The truth was too difficult for them. Because the truth would be that Jesus had the power to heal and make a blind man see. That was not something they wanted to hear. And so they hurled insults at him because he had kind of teased them a little bit. He insulted him and they said, you are this fellow's disciples, but we are disciples of Moses. For we know that God spoke to Moses. But as to this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. They didn't know where Jesus came from. I think they did, but at least they could deny it. We don't know this guy. We'll trust Moses. We already have an established belief and we're not going to change it because somebody worked a miracle. We're not going to change what we already believe because... The Messiah suddenly showed up. I mean, no, can't do that one. Too far for us to go. So there must be another explanation, and they keep looking for it. So the man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. In other words, if Jesus was a sinner, he wouldn't have been able to heal me. He listens to the godly person who does his will, so nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he wouldn't be able to do anything. He'd do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Sometimes... Our own circumstance, our own sin clouds our eyes and we cannot see right before us the very miracles of God. We cannot see the power of God at work in our own lives because we are so sure we know the other answers. And there is God doing that great thing undeniably and yet we might be able to find another explanation. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and he went and found him. And he said to the man, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now this is a turn. The man thought it was, Jesus was a man. Then after the miracle, he thought Jesus must be a prophet because he performed this miracle. Now Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man, the name that was being used for the Messiah? Who is he, sir? The man said, tell me that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Now in the past, we've talked about the confession of Jesus. Jesus, the son of God, the the Messiah, son of the living God. The man doesn't use those exact words, but this is his confession. This is this man who now sees Jesus with his healed eyes and he recognizes that he is the son of man. He is the the one who is the Lord of his life and he now believes in him, the one who performed this miracle. And we know that he believed it because he worshipped him. 
And if he hadn't recognized Jesus for who he was, the Son of God, he would not have chosen to worship him. So how do we answer the original question about who is guilty? Is it this man or his parents? The answer in this story is that all are guilty. Because all have sinned. The blind man and his parents are sinners. We know this. All the Pharisees are sinners. Even all the disciples are sinners. All of the people in the story are sinners except only Jesus is without sin. And yet in this story it is Jesus who they search for to find fault with him, to blame him. It is Jesus who is the one who is willingly chooses to bear our sin and our guilt. Jesus is found guilty not of his own sin, but because he had none, he is found guilty of our sin. Not one sin, all of our sin, our sinfulness. He assumed our guilt so that we can be free of guilt and receive his grace. The blind man didn't deserve to be healed. He was sinner no matter what people say. His parents were sinners. The Pharisees were sinners. The disciples were sinners. But Jesus wasn't stopped by that. Jesus took the sin and healed the sinner. Jesus assumed the fault and the guilt and restored and healed those who were lost. This is what grace is. Grace is when he sees us in all of our sin, all of our brokenness, all of the things that have gone wrong and that we have done wrong, small or large, and they don't make a difference because all is sin. And you're lost from a small sin. You're lost from a large sin. Either way, you need the grace of God. And he sees them all. And instead of writing our sins in the sand for everyone else to see, he forgives us. Not a cheap forgiveness that costs him only words, not just something he says, but real grace and real forgiveness that comes by putting himself in our place. He assumes our guilt to himself and he chooses by doing so the death of the cross. Jesus could not heal this blind man and give him grace unless he was planning to go to the cross. Previous in the series, we read the story of the man let down through the roof. And the first thing Jesus says to him is, you're forgiven. Before he heals him to tell him to walk. Jesus couldn't do that if he wasn't planning to go to the cross and purchase his sins. Purchase that person's life. Giving him the power to heal. Paul describes it this way when he wrote to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Where he says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You don't feel very righteous probably. It's true, you're not, you're a sinner. But Jesus is righteous. And he gives his righteousness to you. The New King James says it this way, some of you may be more familiar. For he made him who knew no sin... To be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. He didn't say we'd become the righteousness of God in ourselves. I'm not righteous. And if I'm having to tell you something, I will tell you, you're not righteous either. Hopefully that's not news. But Jesus is righteous for our sake so that we can be given that gift. He heals us. From guilt to grace. When Jesus heals us, he heals us all the way through. And that's the point of this message today. Is he doesn't just heal a lame leg or a shriveled hand. Or he doesn't just restore blind eyes. Jesus' gift to us is that he heals us all the way through. He holds nothing back. So what is your testimony so your testimony, like this man, does not need to be complicated. 
Your testimony is, this is what I once was, and here's what I am now in Jesus. What miracle did he work in your life? That's the only testimony he wants you to tell. He doesn't need you to tell somebody else's testimony. He only wants you to know what your story is and tell your story. Even if you say the same thing over and over and over again, I was blind and now I see. In verse 39, Jesus says this. He says, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Now, judgment there, we thought, think of judgment as a bad thing, but notice what he's trying to tell us here. He, when he says, I come for judgment, he say, he's basically saying, I'm, I'm come for you to be able to discern. I'm coming so that you will see the truth about yourself. That's the kind of judgment he's interested in. He's not interested in a judgment that condemns you. He's interested in a judgment that you can see your sins for what they are, so that seeing them, you will turn to him. And that's why he says this, so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and they asked, what, are we blind too? And Jesus says, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. In other words, if you really were blind, you wouldn't know any better and I could heal you. If you were blind, you would know that you needed to be healed from your blindness like that man was. And you would be free of guilt because forgiveness would be readily available. But as long as you keep saying, oh, I can see and I'm just fine. I don't need a miracle. I'm doing pretty well on my own. Then you remain truly blind and no need of forgiveness. So Jesus is saying, if we confess our blindness to our own failures, he can be our healer and he can make us whole. But if we continue to pretend that we have not sinned and claim we are not guilty, then we are blind and we will remain in our guilt. So which do you want today? To know that you're blind, guilty of sin, needing Jesus, and asking for him to heal us. I love what Paul says in Romans 5. I don't think they have it for the screen. In Romans 5, verse 20, Paul says, Where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. That's true in our lives as long as we turn to Jesus. It doesn't matter how bad it gets or how bad you think you have been. Where sin abounds, Jesus is more than enough. Jesus is abundant in his grace. He has a never-ending resource because he paid the price already upon the cross. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you again that you are so good. Before we knew it, we were still beggars, blind, we didn't see. And yet you saw us. You saw us in our need and you came to us and you gave us the gift. You bought the gift already upon the cross, even before we breathed our first breath. Before our first breath, you paid the price so that we could come. As soon as we become aware of your goodness and who you are and confess to you, Lord and Savior, you clean us, make us whole, remove the guilt that comes with sin, and restore us through the blessing of your grace. Lord, this week we're going to prepare for our communion. And the biggest thing we can do to prepare is to simply come to you acknowledge you, ask for you to heal us and make us whole. We thank you in Jesus' name.